our hymn of celebration this morning. It's hymn number 145. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing. of our Christian church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, long-standing traditions of St. Paul is that uh, during Promotion Sunday, um, specifically for third graders, that what we want is give them uh, their very own Bible. Now, obviously, our goal is that this Bible would become special for them. It would be something that they would use uh, to read, that they would use as a part of their life, and that they would develop, even at a very young age, a love and care for the Scriptures and allow that to to be a part of their development, to be a part of their identity, and to allow God to use the Scriptures in a way to remind you of how much you're loved by God and, and what God has in store uh, for your life. And so at this time, I do want to invite all the third graders, if you would come around the altar. I'm going to ask, uh, oh, there, there's Donna, okay. Donna, our, our uh, children's minister, when, when Miss Donna reads your name, if you would uh, come to me, and then what we're going to do is uh, we'd like to present you with uh, your own Bible. Hannah Alexander. Knox Amos. Mackenzie Baez. <coughs> Sally Beck. Arthur Bakerstaff. 
John Callie. Whit Hightower. Gray Jones. James Kilgore. Lawson Mansfield. Charlie Martin. John Martin, Jr. Riley Martin. Carly Mayhew. Jenna Mayhew. Charlie Norris. Sarah Pease. Grayson Reed. Katie Ritchie. Carter Rump. David Rump. Zach Shaw. Madeline Steele. Clara Tebow. Virginia Waldrop. Kite Wilson. All right, guys, one of the things that we do is we, uh, we take vows around here in the church, and vows are promises that we make, and we want to ask God to help us in our vows. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bible, and if you would, join me, and let's face the congregation, okay? All right, y'all ready? We have a vow. I want y'all to take this with me, okay? We receive these Bibles with our hands, our hearts, and our minds. Thank you. We will read and study the Bible together. I want you to listen to the congregation because they're going to make a response to you. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you and your family and us as you use this holy Bible in your home, in your church, school, classes, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in our love of God's Word. You ready? The Word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thanks be to God. All right, thank you guys. Y'all may be seated. Part of what we do on Promotion Sunday is obviously with uh, promotion from one grade to the next. Part of it is we have a time of uh, prayer for those who, who have volunteered and to ask to teach. 
Uh, there's not a single church that is alive that doesn't function well uh, without people who serve. And some people who serve inside these walls and some people who, who do the majority of their service outside of these walls. And for those that are serving in our area of education, Sunday school teachers, Bible teachers, small group leaders, things like that, we're grateful, we're very thankful for, for who you are, for what you do. Uh, we want to have a time of prayer, and John's going to lead us at this time. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for a grace and a mercy that you bestow upon us that gives us a glimpse that we can do so, much th so many things with your power and your presence that we could never have done on our own. One of those things, O oh God, is teaching. And I know, O oh God, we... We come to you with many excuses. But we thank you, O oh God, that you remind us that it is not our words, it's not our message, but it's us pointing to you. And so we, we lift up those within our walls who have committed to another year and have responded affirmatively to that call to teach, to point to you, to remind those, O oh God, that, uh, that you are our only comfort. But God, we know that uh, in one way or another, whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're all teachers. We're all coaches and mentors. In fact, O oh God, in our own kingdom, anyone that we have influence over has the potential of becoming a student. And so we stand in the shadow of others who mentor us. And those, oh God, that you have given to us in our care, we mentor them. And may our words be salted with the, the message of hope and love and redemption. Always, oh God, pointing to you and not us. We do thank you, O oh God, for those who have gone on before us, who have taught faithfully, many times uh, not with the uh, spotlight shined on them, but in secret, dedicated, continually pointing towards you. And we know, O oh God, that there were folks in this church and there, are, there were folks in our own lives who have done this. But ultimately, O oh God, we bring glory and honor to you, not only for that message, but, be, but because of the promise of Christ to his disciples, that he would send the Holy Spirit who would ultimately come, become the great teacher. And so, O oh God, may we tune our hearts to the sermon the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us and teach us. We ask that today in our worship services, but not just limited here. We ask it to happen, and that we would be receptive to this in our homes, in our lives, at work and play. In fact, oh God, may it consume us so much that we bring honor and glory to you, that it flows out because you have filled our own cup. We'll be careful, O oh God, to give you all honor and glory, continually pointing to the finished and completed work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. As we remember that prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings. Allow them to be multiplied in this church so that we may further your kingdom and hasten your return. Amen. Like the woman at the well I was seeking for things could not satisfy and then I heard my Savior speaking pro from my well and never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I The millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quit this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. So my brother, if the things this world gave you leaves hard that won't pass away. My blessed Lord and God to save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I walk. passage of scripture from the 
prophet Jeremiah chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. and Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I, then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of God for the people of God. The peace of Christ be with you. I welcome you once again to our worship services, member or visitor. You are welcome and you are in the right place. We're so glad that you're here with us today. There's a red pew pad in the center aisle. Please register your attendance. Pass it down, pass it back again. Learn the names of those who are worshiping around you. And as the children come forward for our children's sermon, I do invite you all to greet those who are around you. Hey, Jack, how you doing? Hey, Meg, what's going on? Did you have a good week at school? All right. Hey, Caps. Actually, I need you today. Only have been in school for three days. You've only been in school for three days? I got gotcha. you. All right. Come on, guys. Ran, come up. All right. Hang on. I'm going to give one second. All right, guys, I want y'all to spread out a little bit, okay? Can you spread out a little bit? There's a, uh, there's a passage that shows up in the New Testament. It's in the book of Luke, and it's about this woman. For 18 years, she struggled with something. And so I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. You ready? All right, and then got to get a little bit of space from each other. I want you to bend down just like this. All right? I like you're going to touch your toes. Look down at your toes. All the way. Just keep on. Just keep looking. All right. Can you imagine? Could you imagine if you had to stay like that forever? It hurts your back, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. Well, let's have another seat. Okay. Let's have a seat. You would be dead. Well, let's hope not dead. Well, there was, there was actually... Yeah, that would hurt even for an hour. There was a lady who was like that. There's a lady like that in the New Testament. She was like that for 18 years. Now, how, how many of y'all are 18? Anybody 18? You think your parents are 18? They're probably, they're, they're, not, they're not 18. I have a cousin that's 19. Well, could you imagine if his whole life he had to bend down just like that the whole time? Well, gee, they're in church. And you know what happens? Jesus sees this lady who's been over like that and she's hurting. And guess what Jesus does? He helps. That's right. He does help her get it. What's he do? They're eighteen. I know it. They're off at school right now, aren't they? Yeah. We need to. They're at Auburn. That's right. Yep. Let's give a shout out to Auburn. Right. Good job. All right. I just lost it. All right. Okay. All right. Well, you you know what? All right. <laughs> back to back to the Gospel of Luke. All right, okay? Shh. Okay, back to the Gospel of Luke. All right, no more booing. No more booing, guys. All right, okay. All right, you see Donna over there? In a minute, y'all going to go to, with Donna? All right, all right, like, uh, let's do this. All right, look at me, guys. All right? He's saying yes All right, no, no more. All right, let's... Jesus heals that lady that's hurting. He... He reaches out and he touches her right on the back. 
and it ends up healing her. Okay. Come here. Hey, you come with me. It's about, you're about to get hurt, I think. Yeah, that must be your older brother. <laughs> All right. All right, will you going to sit beside me? All right. <laughs> okay, maybe not. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. What we're going to do. All right. All right. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face and give you grace and mercy now and forever. Amen. Y'all go with Miss Donna.
On Saturdays, I spend uh, a fair amount of time envisioning the best way to do the children's sermon. And yesterday when I was working outside, I thought, you know what, we'll just do an interactive one. And, uh, and normally when I, I'll mention that to Brooke, just to, sometimes to bounce an idea off of her and she'll say, oh, don't do that. Don't ask all those questions. So when I get home, I'm probably going to get, I told you so. So anyways, I uh, do want to say a word of thanks to, uh, to all of you have been so kind to us and so kind to Brooke and and uh, dear in our, uh, her recovery, and we are really, really appreciative of all the emails and the text messages and just ways that y'all have been uh, just over, over and above. And, and we, I just really want to tell you again how thankful we are uh, for your care for, for me and, and for Brooke and, and for my family and her recovery. Let, let's pray. Well, God, what we want again is in this act of worship where... We want the text to become um, more than just something that we read. We want it to be, we want it to be alive, and we want it to breathe and to to breathe into us. Uh, that's what your scripture says about itself: is it has this ability to to breathe in life and breath. And so, do that again uh, throughout all of Scripture. Whenever God breathes lives are created and changed and and so we want to pray that for us oh god um use us uh if we if you need us to be open to this then we we definitely want to be open to this we know that we can't generate this without you and so we count on you again in this time of worship uh this we humbly pray in the name of christ amen now I'm going to make reference to another text, and so if, if you have your Bibles, or if not, if you want to grab one of the pew Bibles, and just keep Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians is in the New Testament. Uh, it's about 10 or 11 books in, and uh, there's a part that I'm going to reference as a companion piece to this, uh, so that might be helpful if you want to follow along in a moment uh, when, when we look with that. One of the things I love about the Bible, and I'm, I'm so uh, really am I'm excited about our third graders who, who now have this Bible that's a gift on behalf of the church. And one of the things I really adore about the Scripture is that it records for us a, a host of different um, faith journeys and just different people where we get to see them uh, in all aspects of life. Uh, often when things are not going well, and, and you see how they develop and how they walk. It, 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 you know, everything in the Bible is not just a mountaintop experience. Actually, there's more in the Bible that has to do with valley types experiences than, 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 than anything else. And so these, the Bible doesn't hide from that. It doesn't try to polish it up. It doesn't clean up the message. It, it gives record of people who interact with God in all aspects of their life. Uh, and and I, I really just appreciate that about the Bible, that we have a record of that, that we could see that about other people's lives. Uh, these, these faith journeys, they're always leading to something. And, and often for some people it leads to, to a, a, a change of life. It might lead to, to ministry. And, and many times whenever the Bible talks about these record of faith journeys, it uses the word calling. And you see this all over the place in the New Testament uh, in the passage today that John read for us, this is typically known as the calling of Jeremiah. But it's not just the Old Testament that talks about calling. It, it talks about callings in, in the New Testament. Jeremiah's not the only one. I mean, we have a record of Moses, the calling of Moses, the calling of Elijah, the calling of Isaiah. Uh, you've got uh, Paul, you've got the apostles, and you've got people that, that we only know them by name. We really don't know much about their life, but, it, but it, it, it interacts their life with this whole concept of calling. Now, interesting enough, calling in the scripture reveals itself or manifests itself two ways. For the majority of my life, I only, I only understood calling in one way. And it wasn't just in my life like calling for in, into ministry. Uh, I, I, just, I grew up in two churches here in Columbus. Uh, we were in a Baptist church early part of my life until about middle school. And then in middle school, we, we, we moved to a Methodist church. But in both churches, whenever people talked about calling, they talked about it in this one way. And, and there would be uh, 
There would be people who would talk about their life. I'm called to this or I'm not called to that. Uh, um, one of the churches that we attended and we were members of growing up when I was younger, uh, <laughs> we don't do this here. We're probably not. So if you really want this, I'm just kind of giving you a disclaimer. We're probably not going to do this. They used to pass the mic around, you know, like on Sunday nights and people could share from their life. And that's always scared me. I just want you to know. And uh, so I was sitting, I was sitting in the back of the church, maybe about a third up and there was this couple that in my mind, I thought that they were old. They probably were my age, okay? And uh, but I just thought, you know. Anyway, these, 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 this couple, they, they, they get up there. They lived in Columbus for a while, and they, they begin to talk about that they were saying yes to a calling to go into the mission field. They'd been praying about it for a number of years, and, and they had sensed that in their life, and, and they, were, they, they were following. They wanted to be obedient to that calling. And, and that's what I knew about calling. People were called into ministry, but that's only one aspect of calling. Actually, this type of calling is what we would call a specific calling, normally reserved for a certain vocational task inside the church. But I just thought that's what the Bible meant whenever it talked about calling. So if you've got Ephesians with, you, with me, Ephesians 4, the beginning of that chapter, it reads probably something along the lines like this. This is Paul who talks a great deal about calling. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner of serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Verse 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourself together with peace. Verse 4, for there is one body, one Spirit, just as you've been called, uh, one body, one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. And then if you skip down to verse 7, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Now, in the argument in Ephesians, Paul is, is changing the term of calling. You've heard, me talk, you've heard me mention calling three times in those first four verses. This is not specific calling toward vocational ministry inside the church. He's using calling differently. Now, calling specific for vocational ministry inside the church shows up later in verse 7. He's just been talking about calling, and then he says God has given gifts to the church, and in verse 7, he's going to further explain what that means. He says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That's verse 7. Verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, and, and pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That last part is specific calling into vocational ministry inside the church for a specific purpose, to use gifts and graces that were given to those who have specific callings for vocational ministry inside the church to use their calling, their giftedness, their vocation to equip and build up everybody else. You with me? By number, that's a small group. All right? Now you can raise your hands, show of hands. How many of you have been called to a specific vocation inside the church. Raise your hand. Put it up. Come on, don't be afraid. Yep. Maybe one, two, three, maybe four. We got a few. Where's everybody else? So we're supposed to dismiss the early part of Ephesians when, when Paul talks about callings. Does that just not apply to you? That it only applies to me? Whoops. Only applies to John? Need my notes. or to Wayne, or to someone else who, 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 who raised their hands. One type of calling is specific calling. 
In the text that is read in Jeremiah, that is specific calling to the task or to the office to be a prophet for the purpose of building up the people. That's one level of calling. Now, there's another level of calling, and by number, it is a large group of people. It is what we would call a general calling, and that is what Paul is getting at in the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 4. Remember, three times he uses the word called. To you, you're being called, live to your calling. And, and this Karl Barth, uh, who, who was a brilliant, brilliant theologian of the last century, 1920s, 30s, 1940s, was a contemporary of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Karl Barth was really the father of what we call the, the neo-Orthodox movement. Brilliant man. But he wrote a great deal about specific calling and a great deal about general calling. And he said to the, to the general calling, he says, Christian calling is not just reserved for those who are asked to do mighty acts or to do mighty things like Jeremiah. It is an invitation to every Christian, now hear this, to every Christian to witness to the gospel by investing with radical grace Whatever worldly role, role, God opens up to us. To say it differently, it's this. If you belong to Christ, you have been called. And your calling is general to be a witness for Christ. And you serve out your calling in witness and in service to the world. Two different callings. The New Testament just assumes that we know that. It took me a graduate degree in Masters of Divinity and uh, about five years of ministry to figure that out. I thought calling was just reserved for specific calling, and then I would read all these scriptures, and I thought, well, is that to a minister, or does that apply to just anybody? Two different callings. One specific for vocation inside the church, one general that might show up in any vocation, but it's primarily seen in witness or in service. Because this is what it looks like. Let me give you just a a brief breakdown of how God does this with what we call general calling. In the new, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds of basic. Christian theology. So if you can opt out of your first year of seminary, you can clip into your second year. There's an idea that we're outside of the kingdom of God. And that at some point in, in a life of a person, they move from being outside into inside. Now that process of going from outside to inside, we call conversion. For some people, conversions are dramatic. It's, it's like Pauline. They're walking one way, and, and all of a sudden the, the heavens part, and immediately they turn. And it's instantaneous, it's very quick, and it's very profound inside of their life because they're not even expecting it. For another conversion, and it's not one better than the other, it's just a different way that people move from outside in, in, into inside, is they're tracking already with God to some degree. But the, there's, a, there's a part where they say, I want this now. So whether it's a confession, whether it be taking vows, maybe it's confirmation, could be a number of different times. But the step from outside to inside is very, very small. And, and, but both of them are conversions. And so they move from outside into inside uh, through the act of conversion. And, and what the scriptures say, New Testament, is that you receive the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you what this looks like. How many of you love this wonderful drink called coffee? Now, this, that, that has saved so many marriages. The greens being one of them, okay? I mean, we, you know, we got to have our coffee first thing in the morning. When you drink coffee, what are you drinking? Are you drinking the water? Are you drinking the, the beans that you've you know, ground up into just these minuscule, tiny little parts of coffee beans? What, what actually are you drinking? What you're drinking is two different, there's a substance over here and a substance over here that somehow be, come together and they form a completely different 
entity, coffee, which we all love. Now, the Apostle Paul doesn't use the coffee analogy to explain this idea of going from outside into inside and receiving the Holy Spirit, but he uses the phrase new creation. And that might not be the, the best term. It says that when someone moves from outside into inside, they become a new entity where it's one substance, the person, another substance, Jesus, and they come together to form a completely new entity where now it is the person and Jesus together. And they're inside the kingdom. Now we have symbols to celebrate this. We use baptism as one. In some denominations, it's baptism with conversion, I mean, uh, with, with confirmation. But both of them are outward signs of, of this coffee experience with God. And so what we do in baptism or what we do in confirmation is that where we, we confirmation, what we mean by that is someone who's baptized as an infant where the parents take vows vicariously for their child with the understanding that they're going to live a certain way so that eventually when the child gets old enough and sees what's going on, the step is small into the kingdom. And we celebrate that with confirmation. We confirm their vows. But both of them require taking vows. They're outward symbols of that. And one of what we mean by the symbol of baptism or baptism and, and, and confirmation is that it's entrance into, into the kingdom, initiation, welcoming. We celebrate that. There's that coffee experience where they, where they combine with Jesus to form a new entity. And this is what I want you to get. They are commissioned to their general calling in the world to be a witness and to be a servant. That is all of us. All of us. In that coffee experience with Jesus Christ, to becoming one, you're given gifts for witness. You're given gifts to be a servant. And so we, we, when we leave this place, our commissioning is to go out into the world and be the, the, the physical representation of what it's like to be connected to this Jesus. And you have been called by God for that purpose. And the church has commissioned you to, to be deployed out into the community to be that witness wherever it may be. It's not tied to specific vocation inside the church. Now, that would be one of the geographies that it would take place. So if you are in education, then, then you become the, the representative. You become the, the physical example of what it means to be connected to Jesus in education, in medicine, in law, in your own employment, wherever it may be, wherever you go, you've been commissioned because you've been called. And that calling is to be the representative to the world of what it's like to be connected to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's all of us. You know how important this is? Do you know how many people, just in Columbus, Georgia, not the world, forget the world, just in Columbus, Georgia, that are longing for just one person who will simply say, I will be a, I'll be an example of what it's like to be connected with this God on, on the things in my life that have been very difficult, very dysfunctional, all the valley times, all the good times, the wholeness of what I am. You, at least you'll get to see what it looks like to be connected to Jesus. Not that we're perfect. I, I don't know if the world is looking for perfection. You know what I think the world's looking for? Permission givers. 
examples of what it means to be forgiven. You know, what God does in this whole, this whole process of, of, of being outside, then into inside, and then being commissioned out, God takes every experience. See, we think that God will only use us if we're really good or if we get it down right. No, God takes everything. And for all of us, there's more dysfunction than there is the healthy parts in the beginning. He takes all of that and he cultivates it. And it's, remember, coffee experience. He's with us. And so people need to see what that looks like. That you belong to someone who forgives. That you belong to someone who redeems. That you belong to someone who equips, someone who commissions. You belong to someone who is willing to sit with people even when they're unlovable and be loving. That's your commission. That's your calling. But whether it be specific callings or whether it be general callings, you know what our response will be? It'll look real close to the response that Jeremiah gives. Oh, wait a minute, God. Uh, I'm just a boy. I, I, you know, I, I've been trained for that. I don't know what to say. I'm either too young, I'm either too old. I don't know enough, maybe I know too much. Or I can't do it. Or maybe the most honest soul that just says, I won't do it. That was me. I don't want to do this. And so we either through fear, anxiety, the feelings of inadequacy, we will say, I don't know about this calling. Whether it be specific or whether it be general, whoa, 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 that's too much. In both settings, specific callings or general callings, it's the... God is the one that calls and God is the one that equips. You know what's required of us? Just a willingness. That's it. I mean, do you honestly think the God that you serve the God that loves you, that, that you love, is actually just going to say, all right, it's up to you. Go get it done and come back when it's done. Do you think that's the way it works? No. Every single step along the way, whether, the, whether you think you're old enough, young enough, know enough, don't know enough, it doesn't matter. The God who calls you equips you. He just wants our willingness. Whether it's specific calling that leads to certain levels of vocation inside the church or whether it be what we call the general calling for all of us to go out in the world to be a witness. Just will you, will you, will you be a part of it? I understand Jeremiah. Hang on, God. I don't know about this. The same God that called Jeremiah also is the same God that reaches down and gives him exactly what he needs. And he'll do the same for you. I, I want to do something to close this with something I've never done before. And it really has more to do with my own fear than anything else. I, I've, uh, one of my biggest fears is that what I say here it, it comes across as manipulation. And there are people who do that, unfortunately. And, so I, and it's an overreaction on my end. I understand that. And so I, I have been scared to death throughout my whole ministry to preach on specific callings. there might be someone here 
And maybe this might be for parents. That where God, it, it might just seem like just a, a gut feeling. That maybe someone's experiencing and they're sensing specific calling. And they're afraid. And they feel inadequate. And they don't know what to do. And so there might be people who end up being sealing people in their lives that can see things about them that they can't even see of themselves. That might be you. Not in manipulation. If it's not anybody in here, then I, I really do hope you've toned me out for the last two minutes. But if it's not, just trust it. Callings so often are progressive. It's like smoke clearing. The more you walk, the, the clearer it becomes. Just don't dismiss it. Just allow it to sit. The God who calls is still the God that equips, even for specific callings. Will you join me in prayer? We don't want to dismiss the call you have for all of us to be a witness, to be a servant. But for those that it might be specific, not that it's more important, it's just the giftedness that you've given to us lies to help others live into their calling. For those that feel inadequate, for those that are fearful, or even people like me that just didn't want to do it. Keep that call on. Even if they run. And to the point where they come to the understanding that the God who calls is also the God who equips. This we humbly pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Our hymn of consecration you'll find, it's hymn number 529, How Firm a Foundation. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the last only. First, second, and fifth, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs>
hair envy for their boys. Uh, Bobby and Henry, ages five and three, and they're coming to unite with the membership here. We all be faithful to the United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness for the transformation of the world. If so, answer I will. It's my pleasure to welcome you in. Uh, John is uh, going to stand by you for a little bit. I want to give you an opportunity to, for you to come and introduce yourself to them uh, at the close of the service. Um, I'm also going to give a blessing, so if you're staying for lunch and you get into the fellowship hall, go ahead and start. All be good. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face and his countenance and give you rest and peace. And would you bless our time of fellowship and food and sharing together. Amen. Amen. 